Welcome to my slack shed. I'm Jake Monahan. I'm an East Coast Highliner and an Amsteel splicing enthusiast. And this is a grog loop. The grog loop was conceived in 2014, so it's a relatively new splice compared to the ones we've been testing and using for years. The grog loop creates a strong continuous loop without the need for lock stitching your tails, although you can still lock stitch if you'd like to, to ensure your tails won't move at all over time. Although the Brummel splice in the middle here reduces the rope's strength down to 70%, I would assume in a loop form, it would be a theoretical 140% double that 70%. I recently conducted a backyard brake test on a more small scale amp steel, 2.5 millimeter grog loops. Now, 2.5 millimeter amp steel is an MBS of about 6.5 kilonewtons. So with a theoretical 140% efficiency, I would assume that this would break at between eight and nine kilonewtons. Highest one yet. Oh, it's warm. I feel like Ryan Jinx, you guys. It's warm. I was pretty surprised when the results showed a average braking strength of 10.4 kilonewtons. And I was even more surprised when two out of five of the brake test samples did not break at the Brummel splice. Um, they broke either at the end of the tail or where it was connected on the carabiner, but it still failed just as strong or stronger than the other three samples that broke at the splice here where they're expected to. I decided to do these brake tests after talking to a few other highliners who had the same ideas of testing the grog loops further, since they could potentially be a new method for splicing together webbing segments for longer lines. So what I'm wondering is, will there be a jump in efficiency if we break a larger diameter made of a 12 strand am steel, like five or six mil? Will different size tail berries affect the braking strength of each loop? Well, we're gonna find out on this next episode of How Not to Highline. Hi, I'm Ryan Jinx and welcome to my lab where I like to say wow after every test to keep this as engaging as possible because I'm also a Dyneema nerd. Jake made me six five millimeters and six six millimeter loops. Now the variation we're going to explore today is how long the berry matters on the strength. Now all the loops we're testing today are all made from Amsteel Blue, which are not always blue. I know that's confusing. That brand name is the quality called SK75, and there's SK78, SK99, SK99 Max, and they're either just either different qualities or different processes that make them either stronger or have less creep. Once they're tensioned, they don't lose that tension. And SK75 is super good enough for everything I'm using, and I am not so worried about creep when I'm making a soft shackle. Now, if I'm rigging, I don't know, a 3,000 foot long zip line on and <laughs> I had am steel diameter I should not be using, then yeah, creeps a problem. Yeah! Yeah! Now, something I found interesting over testing these over the last few years is the strength really depends on the rate in which you pull. If I dynamically load these or shock load them or pull them too fast with my hydraulic here, then I actually get a lower result. That might be from the heat it generates. It technically has a lower melting point, even though it's still pretty high. Uh, it's lower than nylon. And you know, if it heats itself up and then it melts it, it's just plastic, right? So what I'm going to do is pull this to about 4.4 kilonewtons or a thousand pounds of force and kind of leave it there for about 30 seconds, let everything settle and then pull it to failure. And I have two different size shackles that we're gonna be connecting this to to see if it consistently breaks at the lower diameter because typically the bigger diameter or bigger bend radius uh, that this is wrapped around, usually it'll also retain strength. So we're gonna learn quite a few things here, not just that the berries of the tails might not matter. I don't know, that is my theory. Okay, here's our first five millimeter test with a tail shorter than recommended, ready to go. And I pulled it to 4.45 kilonewtons and you can see how it went up and then it's kind of settling over time. And I think that's just really interesting to know. So now let's pull this, now that it's been about 30 seconds, to failure. Oh my gosh. This did not break, it slipped. That's interesting because when I've ever Brummel spliced, I'm like, oh, this is bomber and it's so locked, but it it's not. I did another test where we had a spliced eye, not a spliced loop like this, and the Brummel came undone. And that was 
supposedly, according to Tufelberger's recommended tailberry, because you don't need as long of a tail. That was the whole point of what they were say saying, because it's brummeled. Now, the MBS, or the minimum breaking strength of 5 millimeter Am Steel Blue, is 4,900 pounds of force, or 21.8 kilonewtons. In theory, we should be getting like 180, according to animatednots.com, and 180% of that should be 39.2. We got 17 and 18 kilonewtons. So, make sure you bury your tails long enough. It's that finger trap action that really gives these things strength, which is the whole reason we're splicing them and not tying knots in them. So now I'm gonna pull on the ones that have the recommended berry length. <laughs> That one actually broke. Is that funny? We're using soft shackles to break splices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's breaking. So this broke the way I'm more used to seeing this break is it leaves one of the 12 strands behind. and it broke. Now it's crazy the variations we can get in these tests. Now usually when you see a one number or an MBS number, it's a polished version of what I'm doing here. But Animated Knots is claiming that you can get 180% out of these loops, 180% of MBS. Now if you splice this stuff eye to eye and you pull it, in theory, you're supposed to be able to get close to MBS. So if you put in a loop, it should double that or a little bit less because life. So 108% is reasonable, but I'm getting 133 to 150%. But Jake was getting with his smaller diameter and the way he tested it, 150 to 180%. So now I'm gonna try the six millimeter Dyneema and I'm gonna find out if this is breaking the same way for me percentage wise, uh, or if we're gonna get something wildly different. Look at the way those strands have that melted plastic look to them. Oh, interesting. This is the splice. It broke where it was touching the other shackle. In the splice. Ice, and it broke where it was going around the shackle and then we've got two strands or three strands that were left behind and extended out like that isn't that crazy how stiff this rope gets it's just after it gets pulled it kind of just stays in that shape until you loosen it up so just to see what will happen i'll throw this two to one on so this pulley ends up pulling on it and the hydraulic pulls on one leg of this bigger am steel and <coughs> We'll find out if pulling slower gives us, uh, can get us over that 50 kilonewton mark. My theory was right. It broke in the splice higher when we pulled it slower. found it. And this probably means I should put the nut on this thing instead of being lazy. Now our last one I'm doing a little different. I'm putting the splice on the end to see if that makes any of difference. You can see it was on that shackle and the splice broke here where it was on that shackle. It does look pretty neat. I think it broke quite a bit lower. 38.16. I don't get it. I pulled slower and I got a higher result. Like I willed it into existence. And then I continued to pull it slower with the two to one, right? Pulls twice as slow. And I was still getting low results. Like I was getting all the way down to 111%. And then the, the tails didn't slip on the, the short berries. It's broken like it's splice or the shackle. And it was breaking at like, 100 or 120 percent 
Dyneema, I'm finding, is kind of all over the board. That's the summary of all of our videos. It's pretty damn strong, but uh, you can't just like summarize it in one number, especially when you're using it in all sorts of things. Like, depends what you put the loop around. Now, usually we use the phrase super good enough on this channel because even if Jake loop splices his webbings together, like he is potentially going to do with this, this six millimeter stuff at least is breaking no lower in our tests than 33 kilonewtons, which is stronger than most webbings he's gonna connect it to. Now, I don't think that's the most efficient way. I think double wrapping a four millimeter soft shackle is going to be bomber and removable, just as easy to tie a soft shackle as it is to try to splice all this together while it's wrapped around webbing. 41.99, damn. Now this isn't the only type of loop you can make. Make sure you go to the video right here to check out the ones that we did with David for sailing context, where you take an even skinnier Dyneema and you wrap it around three times inside of a chafe cover. And the one eighth inch or three-ish millimeter di diameter is pretty cheap. Because you have to splice the tails in and bury them a certain length, you can only make loops or even soft shackles so long. So making them as small as you can and then double or triple or quadruple wrapping them can get whatever components you're trying to connect together pretty tight. Make sure you go to our blog. It's gonna have this chart, more information. And if somebody gives me some amazing research paper they found, I'll include it in there so I can continually update the blog. I cannot update videos after I click publish. Now, take it away, Jake. Here's my finished product. This is what it's gonna look like when we're done. So I measured out a piece long enough that my tails can splice through and they're not quite touching, but they almost are. It's not necessary for them to touch. Sometimes they'll overlap. It all depends on how big your loop is gonna be. Uh, the one rule is the tails have to be 30 times the diameter of the rope you're working with. Six millimeter amp steel, so I need at least 18 centimeters for my tails. I like to round it up to about 19 or 20, just for good measure. So you're gonna splice through your first tail here and send your end right through. Strand that was just spliced into is going to go into that first strand that we spliced. So the one that is not sliding is going through the one that is sliding. So I measure up my tails, same length. We're gonna splice right into here. Make sure you've got six strands on each side. All right, six strands on one side, six strands on the other. And there we have our splice. So this is the same as the Bromel eye splice. You would bury this tail into the tensioned line, but for the grog splice, the tails are gonna cross over like this, and we're gonna bury them right inside in these directions. There's gonna be one side that's closed off and if you can see, there's going to be another side that has this little bit of an opening here. I like to do the closed off side first. So bury your tail nice and high up in those strands so that your tail won't come out over time, or at least will be less likely to come out over time. Pull that through. Now we're going to want to pull it pretty tight so that it really buries itself into, uh, into itself here. Then we're going to taper our tail.
Now that our tail is tapered, we can pull it right through. And we'll do the same exact thing on this side, but you've got a perfect indication of where to get your fid. Make sure you just go straight into that chute that it kind of provides for you on this side. I like to snip three at a time when I'm tapering my tails. Some people can do two at a time, four at a time. It's kind of a preference thing. All right, we've got our second tail all done, pulled on nice. Pull that tail through and there we have our grog splice. This tail is the one that's probably gonna bulge out maybe over time when it's kinked back and forth. So I like to just kind of flip it right over and that way it sort of stays on the inside and it's just a little more protected 